Welcome to Peloton Magazine and Aerogram subscribers. This podcast is created in partnership with the global team at La Course on Tet and the crew at award-winning Peloton Magazine. Now, this episode, we'll talk about Bottle, we'll lament the postponement of Parry Roubaix, and of course, dissect Homer Simpson's favourite monument. Flanders! What? Flanders! What? What is it? Game's out there! <laughs> Made you look. <laughs> Hello, this is Jeremy Whittle. Change of scene this week. I'm preparing sashimi and parmigiana in Tom Cruise's kitchen. Hello, it's Peter Cousins. I'm in the Pyrenees in uh, in France and I'm locked down again and riding in circles. I'm Sophie Smith, waking up in Melbourne, Australia with a duvet around me because the sun's definitely leaving our shores. And I'm OJ Borge in a glass case of emotion. And we are here, you are here, and the Spring Classics are definitely here and thus Flow Bikes has you covered. Watch them live and on demand in the United States, Canada and Australia. Plus, you can go inside the race with athlete interviews, in-depth course previews, expert analysis and other exclusive content. The cobbles, as we always say, are calling. So don't miss out. Subscribe now. Flowbikes.com forward slash aerobikes. That's F-L-O bikes dot com forward slash aerogram with an E. Uh, Easy question to start with. How is everyone? How are we all? I'm not as hungover as you, OJ. Well, that's... (laughs) Because <laughs> it was your birthday, wasn't it? Wasn't yeah, it your birthday? It was my birthday. Do you know what? I don't try to tell anyone. I really did try and keep it under wraps by only putting it on Instagram five times and Twitter yeah. multiple times. But you Noticed. know what? It got out. Word got out. And I do have to say, though, that I missed all of the racing over the weekend. So I've seen nothing, which means, Jeremy, I need you audibly using actual words to describe it all for me in a bit. Are you up to this task? Well, I hope so. Ably aided by... Sophie and Peter. Well, to a second. But first, we always need to hear from the man in the club chair. It's the king of the hell of the north. William Fotheringham has this week's cycling headlines. Well, how did the biggest week's racing of the spring look from the warmth of the club chair through the prism of a Belgian beer? Two key results. Annemiek van Vleuten and Kasper Asgreen's crushing wins in Flanders on Sunday. Van Vleuten's attack on the Canariberg to rip the peloton to shreds will go down as one of the big moments of this April. So too the fraction of a second in the Flanders finish straight when Matthew van der Poel realised he'd left it all out on the road and Asgreen took the sprint. It isn't often you see VDP going, OK, I'm done. But AVV smashing it up a climb is a kind of reassuring sight and it came five days after a dominant victory at Guadalajara Dor Vlaanderen. The other big story this week was classics related as well, but not so happy. Sadly, it's no surprise to see the two Parry Roubaix postponed yet again. So let's start doing an October rain dance now. A quick look at the rest of the week, with Natha Buhani producing a candidate for Quote of the Month when he said that bunch sprints aren't the Care Bears. That's funny, but not so much the fact that amidst his public spat with Jake Stewart, he's ended up receiving racist abuse on social media. That's shocking. Elsewhere, we've seen the last of the Super Tuck, and we've seen the first rider DQ'd for bunging away a bid on. Step forward, Mikel Schaar. Results-wise, Alejandro Valverde showed he still has it, although he's officially a veteran now, when he took the Grand Prix Miguel Indurain on Saturday. Dylan van Baal gave Ineos a rare Classics victory at Dwarf Dor Vlaanderen, when the de Kooning Wolfpack went absent for a day. And Arno de Mar returned to winning ways at the Grand Prix Tourangel in, in central France. Next up, Skelder Price, where the programme includes a women's race for the first time. Hats off to Flanders Classics for that. While down in the Basque country, it's Itzulia, the race without a single yard of flat road. Finally, we can't watch Roubaix this year, but if you want to talk about the race instead of watching it, I'm doing that on Thursday with my friend, the third umpire, and you can still sign up. William Fotheringham. There, our resident Parry Roubaix guru, very much a disappointed man after the long anticipated postponement due to COVID 19 of next week's Parry Roubaix. You can read more about that over on lacourseontet.com and also do a deep dive with his excellent book, A Sunday in Hell, and all of the news that he went into there. We shall now divest a little more and we'll start with the Tour of Flanders. Uh, 105th edition of Duron happened over the weekend. Second monument of the season and a race described by George Hincapie is so hard that it might as well be a different sport. 254.3 kilometres, 19 climbs and a whole lot of pain. Uh, and Pete, as was um, put to us there by William Fotheringham, won by elegant quick steps Casper Asgren in a tour sprint with Matthew van der Poel. 
Was it a classic classic? I think it was. I think it was a really good edition of the, of the Ronde, yeah. I mean, I know a lot of people have been saying that uh, As Green was a, a bit of a surprise winner, but he, he did win the, the GP E3 a couple of weeks back, and that has been in the past a good indicator of who's going to go well at Flanders. He was second here two years ago, another good indicator of he goes well on this course. And he, he was the strongest man. We, we saw it all the way through the race, and he proved it at the end. I'd, I'd agree completely with that. I don't think, don't think it was a surprise really at all, was it? I mean, he's very much in form. He's won Kern of Brussels Kern as well in the past. Um, he was the, he was went with all the moves that he needed to go with at the moments that he needed to go with them. He was definitely his team's strongest rider, as you said. You know, he's got he's got the pedigree in Flanders as well. So, you know, he's been a nearly man before, and I think that was just a coming of age victory for him. So, I'd expect we'll see more of him in those situations in the future. I mean, it was interesting. I mean, as I said before, I missed all of the racing over the weekend due to those celebrations, the birthday celebrations. I've really tried not to talk about. But um, it was it was interesting because almost as exciting for everyone was was As Green's win was the fact that Matthew van der Poel cracked in a sprint because up to this point, it's almost like he wasn't capable of cracking. I, w- I was kind of almost like leaving the room. You know, when the sprint started, I was like... I'll just go and put the kettle on. Because <laughs> right. I was well, like, yeah, then. F- well done, Matthew. Foregone, foregone conclusion. You know, I can watch this later. I've got to get on with something. I've got to do the recycling. And then I kind of paused and looked over my shoulder. And you, there was this moment, wasn't there, where you just saw he was pumping away, trying to get more power out of his legs. And he knew he hadn't got it. And he just, and then his head went down. And that was, and it was just like a little, like a bubble exploding, you know, that he just, re- he just suddenly realized. Then he shook his head. And you you just wondered how much he paid for the efforts that he'd made, kind of a, in the in the last hour of the race when when he I mean he set up the key escape that led to that final sprint. But it was it wasn't a surprise that As Green won. It was a surprise that Van der Poel was so capitulative in the in the sprint. I thought. I think you've got to remember that As Green does have a mean sprint on him as well. He won a points classification at the Tour of uh, California two years ago like he's to me that's how I've always remembered him or referred to him as um more so having like a quick finish on him so in that scenario I think I wrote about this earlier this week I know everyone's wax lyrical about the big three all spring <laughs> but there are other people in the peloton <laughs> that are quite able and what I actually like about the results of Flanders and um the rest of the spring classics has been that we've actually seen that Mm. And Van der Poel admitted, didn't he? He said after he said, "I think I, I think he was the strongest guy." He didn't, he didn't, he didn't contest that he got the sprint wrong, wrong or anything like that. It was, it was a very kind of gracious admission that you know he was, he was the strongest rider on, on, on the day. So surely I think- then, we, I mean, surely, I mean, we we jumped on the hype train of Matthew Van der Poel and Wout van Aert. So should we jump off it and say they're all spent and that's it? They're not going to another thing for the rest of the year, maybe the rest of their careers. No, I think it's a different scenario. I think that now they are kind of marked men. Oh, do you? I so mean, you th- you think it's the fact that they're marked because I well, mean, because more they, they raced they raced a big old a big old chunk of last year. Then they went straight into the cross season, and then they're back out again. They're gonna be tired. Yeah, but they were the kids, weren't they? Before the the upstarts, they're not anymore. They're the they're, now the, they're the points of reference. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So how does being marked make your legs more tired? Well, it also gives you a mental advantage. I I, I would think if you're marked. I mean, I was going to say this about. I've been referring to them all season as De Kernick quick step, not elegant quick step. Well, it's only one race, isn't it? They're, <laughs> they're only elegant. And as I believe, elegant is a different type of window that De Kernick make, if I'm if I'm correct. With oh, fabulous. Right. I that's was, why, that's why thought that was elegant. my second, not with the times faux par this week. So I'm glad it's, I'm glad oh, it's I thought, not. I thought, you, I thought you were going to say something kind of Oscar Wilde-esque there about elegance rather than <laughs> just about double glazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being marked men, uh, you know, with... Uh, a sound glazed window or not, um, I think gives you a bit of a mental advantage as well sometimes, doesn't it? Because other teams will come in or other riders will come in and and be wary of you or perhaps start to doubt their own their own ability in comparison. I, th- I um, think the, the, but I think the, if you're Van der Poel or, you know, also to be fair to him, like elegant quick step, they come into these races uh, sort of with such firepower and I guess reputation that, and in the final of Flanders especially, it was just attack after attack after attack. So 
I guess that would probably perhaps wear even someone like Vanderpoel down a little bit um, when it's just him. I mean, I think there's a burden. <laughs> That there's a burden on him and Wout van Aert to make the race in inverted commas now, isn't there? Which which there wasn't perhaps, well, well maybe there was last year, but there wasn't until fairly recently, in, within the last kind of year year or so, that they they are you know everybody sits and waits and and watches because they know that their attacks, well, especially van der Poel's attacks are so powerful that you've got you you've got to have a lot in reserve to respond. So you you can't. They're the, they're the benchmark for everybody else in the peloton. Isn't, isn't that fair to say that? I, I think that's right. I think the, the other thing that's kind of been a bit overlooked is the fact that to, the elegant or, or de Kerning, as we, we know them as normally, just had, had, they had numbers. I mean, they had Alaphilippe is obviously on their team, but they had Seneschal up there. Um, they, they always had riders in reserve and... Uh, there was a great quote actually by Alexander Roos in in Le Keep in his in his race report this morning saying that uh, Van Aert and uh, and Van der Poel he said they they could have set up a uh, a solvent company given the you know, number of gaps that they had to close down every time Quick Step attacked they had to, one of them had to chase them down Van der Poel and uh, and Van Aert didn't have any teammates with them I mean Jenny Vermersch was there occasionally for for Alpecin Phoenix for for Van der Poel's team but. Quick Step or De Kerning or Elegant or whatever we're calling them, they were there in numbers all the time and that made the difference. It was a team win. Here's, here's a question for you. Where, the Quermont, which is, I think, the Quermont was the final climb, wasn't it? Am I right in thinking No, that? the Paterberg's the, the Paterberg. final climb. Where does the Paterberg or any of the climbs at the Tour of Flanders, where do they rate in world all-time climbs? I mean, how iconic are they? Where do they rate for you? Hugely, hugely iconic, but they're totally different from kind of major mountain climbs because they're so short and intense. The, the Quarimont's a, a great climb, but I, I, I really love the Paterberg. I mean, it was where Van Vleuten went away in, in the women's race. I mean, she kind of scattered a lot of her rivals by that point, but it was where she made her move. It was where we saw um, Van der Poel and, and uh, Asgreen, but they were already away, but we could see then that they were the strongest, that nobody, Van Aert was... I mean, he just went to pieces, just like was, was that, zigzag, zigzagging that, all over the climb. That was memorable, wasn't it, seeing him zigzagging? <laughs> it was, yeah. I mean, you expect that from somebody going up. I mean, it is it is steep. I mean, I've, I've ridden up it myself, and it's it's a, it's a fearsome climb. What are we talking, but 20, 25? In, in parts, it's probably 20, I would think. Maybe, it maybe just touches 20, but... Uh, I mean, they'd done it three times, and that's it was just the the repetition that, that got to him in the end. He just ran out of juice. Uh, well, you mentioned the women's race there, Pete, so let's talk about that. 152 kilometres, still all of the climbs. Annemiek van Vluten back to her barnstorming best, winning the race for the second time after taking the title in 2011. Uh, first victory for Movistar on the Women's World Tour as well. And, Jeremy, it was it was Annemiek van Vluten, AVV, as William Fotheringham called her, um, back to her absolute best. Yes, her irresistible best. But also, there seemed to be this hiatus um, towards the what, final six, seven, eight K, where you expected a really concert, uh, concerted pursuit to build behind her, and it never really came. And I don't know if that slightly dev- not devalues, but slightly, it's, it was slightly un- anticlimactic. I, I I felt because I thought I thought there was going to be more more riders attacking off the front in pursuit of her than we actually saw. But uh, still, it was an incredibly impressive win. I mean, I, I think, was that her most impressive win since since the world in Yorkshire? Or would people think that? I think so. I yeah, would say so, because right. I read also that she's the oldest woman to have won Flanders in oh, its really? entire history yeah. at 38 I, I, years I of age. I agree with, with what Sophie said about it originally, that it was kind of a bit of a disappointing race. I mean, probably for the reasons that Jeremy has said as well, that... Once, once Van Vleuten got over the top of the, the Paterberg with like 11, 12 kilometres to go, I think her lead was only about six seconds. And the group behind her, I mean, there were seven really strong riders in there. And two, two of them, uh, or four of them were from two different teams. So they, they had the opportunity to kind of sacrifice teammates to, to chase her down. And it just, it just never came together. And it was just... I mean, I know people complaining about San Remo. Nothing happens for for two hundred and eighty kilometers, and then it's like just complete mayhem in the last ten or fifteen kilometers. Well, Flanders just went flat. I mean, it it just you were waiting for something to happen, and it never did. 
I'd agree with that. I think I think it was it it felt a bit flat, which is probably a disservice to her effort, I guess, because you know it was a very impressive victory. But at the same time, it, you 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 did kind of expect a bit more, a bit more tension, I think, in the in the final five k. Why the lack of? It was odd that Eliza Longo Borghini was apparently told by her team not to participate in the chase, either. So from that, I well, I still don't understand that either. But I always feel it's a little disappointing when. The teams. I don't know if the chase group just, uh, just just didn't have it, but it seemed to be also more political that um, either they were told not to or just sort of didn't believe that um, that they'd be able to match AVV. Well, so I mean, I mean, in some ways, yes, you can say then that it went flat, but it went flat because of the perceived threat and how good Annemiek van Vluten is. So surely that, in some ways, is excitement there, seeing how some how strong somebody is, how dominant they are. Yeah, but I mean, you st- you still want them to be pushed as far <laughs> if they are that strong. You still want to be them to be pushed as far as far as they can be. And, I mean, a perfect example of that was in was in the men's race in the last mm. five hundred meters because we saw you know a rider who had the best of Math- Matthew van der Poel. And if we, if if we just looked at that on paper, seeing those two riders were going into the last kilometer side by side, you just said, oh, well, there's only one winner here. So you know, it's it's always good to have have a surprise, isn't it? Whereas it felt like as Pete was saying it was a it was a fait accompli once they got to the last five or six k really, and I think that's kind of you know that's not that's not that exciting just watching a rider solo. However, the impre- however impressive the performance is. Mm. So let's talk bedons and the new and hotly debated UCI rules on littering. Pete, what is the the rundown on this? What happened at Flanders? Because somebody was thrown out of the race for putting their bead on in the wrong place or dropping their bead on at the wrong point. Yeah, it was it was Mikko Shah of the AG two R Citroen team. And it was it was a bit of a bizarre in, in, incident because he'd been uh, he kind of been tailed off the end of the peloton. I don't I don't know whether it had a mechanical problem or he was he was chasing back on. And he just kind of came around this corner in full view of the camera, and uh, there was a guy. I mean, I've I've heard people describe him as a kid standing at the side of the road. But I mean, if this guy was a kid, I'm a kid. I mean, he was like in his <laughs> he was in his forties, oldest kid in town, <laughs> waving for a bead on and. Shah duly tossed his bead on across the road to the, towards this guy and immediately kind of put his hand to his forehead, realising what he'd done and thought, that's it, kind of game over. And within a few minutes, uh, the motorbike commissaire was uh, was coming up alongside him and saying, that's it, you, you're DQ'd, mate, for, for littering. I mean, I mean, how, sh- how should we take this? Because in some ways, fair enough, rules are rules. And I, I know there's been there's been chat before that rules have changed and just the riders haven't read them or taken them in or, or took the time to understand what the rules mean but if he understood that he'd done something wrong and somebody was waving for a bead on his throwing it to him maybe it's a small fine maybe it's a slap on the knuckles is it a dq is it a dqable moment well I'd agree, I'd agree completely with that i think first of all it's 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 new um so i think you have to have a little bit of lenience on the riders if they if they forget the habit of a career you know they've all been doing this for I mean how many days of racing you know for a guy who's in his mid 30s I can't remember how old Shah is but he's been around a while and you know they throw a bottle away and it's just it's almost a reflex action and as you said Pete he immediately immediately realized what he'd done so I'd have thought there should be some kind of sliding scale and you introduce this gently over kind of three months or whatever and first of all it starts off with a fine then it starts off with a relegation or whatever, and then you reach the point where you DQ people because you make it clear that there are zones where they can drop litter um, and drop wrapping from is, is it a litter, or whatever. Is, is it a littering issue? I mean, is the bead on thing a littering issue? Because it's the image of the sport. It's the image of the sport. Well, isn't yeah, it? because, but, I mean, because it's, the sport's not got a not not got a green image. It's got it's got a, a dirty image um, true, in true, terms of its eco footprint. The throwing of a bottle towards a fan, I mean, whether a kid or not, I mean, everyone's going, oh, you know, kids, they remember it, and that's the thing, you know, and they grow up and they treasure these bead-ons. The fact that he was however old Pete said he was or not, but surely there is a difference between throwing a bead-on towards someone and dropping a gel wrapper or just throwing your, your litter on the floor. There is a difference between Well, the also, there's a difference in where you do it, isn't there? Because if you do it in a town or a village where there's, you know, They're a thousand people up. standing and watching the race, that's completely different mm. to doing it in a national park if you just throw it into a ravine. Mm. 
Oh, absolutely. Mm. Does anyone... Particularly in a pandemic as well, I'm not sure how healthy it is. (laughs) (laughs) If you're a fan picking up a a bit on it, maybe that's purposeful of race organisers. Like, it sends sends a statement, doesn't it? And a stronger statement than... Maybe maybe If you're DQ'd for doing this, they're being serious about it. Maybe you're just really careful which teams bid on you suck on because you, yeah. know, you, you pick up you well, pick up a lot up of the, them are like locked shut now too so well, I know, I've never yeah. understood yeah. like wanting to take someone else's dirty drink bottle home glued in the first place yeah. let alone in a yeah in a pandemic is, is it is it a safety aspect as well because we saw Geraint Thomas out of the Vuelta Giro last year Vuelta or Giro was it we hit? Giro it was the Giro. Giro um you know so obviously he put himself out of the race because of of hitting a bottle is it a safety issue as well or is it literally just the littering and, and the green image well I think the the, the safety issue comes into it because um, bottles can be thrown away and then they, they bounce back off a curb or off something and, and come back into the bunch and, and then it becomes a real hazard for all of the riders. But I mean, I think, I mean, all this stuff about there were, there were people there and it's, it's a different thing to throwing at somebody at the side of the road than it is if, he, if you're in the middle of the countryside. I mean, the rules there, the commissaire's got the rule. He's in he or she has, has applied the rule. That's Everybody's agreed it. So to, to be honest, I can't understand what all the debate about. I mean, we should have been having the debate before the race rather than after the race, really, on the on this rule. Like, I mean, I'm kind of a, a bit lost. But it got a bit more complicated, didn't it? Because there was, there's a lack of information when you're watching the race as a TV viewer on where the zones are. So, you know, I, I saw Woot Van Aert fish around in his, in his jersey in one of the pockets pull out what looked like a gel wrapper or a bar wrapper or something and just throw it on the road. And I thought, well, is that in the zone? Why isn't he being disqualified as well? Because that's definitely littering. But if it's in the zone, then it's okay. And after a series of exchanges over social media with a couple of other people, it it became apparent that it was supposedly in one of the zones. So he's okay. But then... Letizia Borghese, who rides for the for the Rome Italia Basso Bikes Viano team, she was disqualified, and then her fine was apparently more than Annemiek van Vluten's prize money, which seems bonkers to me. Yeah, I mean that's that, that's not right, is it? I mean, I, th- I think I don't think that could be right unless it's. I mean, to be fair, I haven't been able to uh, find what the women's prize money was this year, but a couple of years ago, I think it was around twelve hundred euro. And I've never seen a fine that's worth twelve hundred euro at any no, race. No. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe she was exaggerating there a, a little bit. Um, I mean, but I if, guess I still, if it's two hundred euro or something like that, um, from the women's prize money point of view, that's that's a lot of money. It's a big chunk it's just, of it. It's disproportionate, definitely, isn't it? I mean, it, it, you get how much you you get a fine, don't you? If you if you go if you're going to have a pee in in a indiscreet place you know you get when when you get the communiques after each race or after each stage of a major stage race the UCI list the fines that have been handed out whether they're for illegal feeds or whatever or for or for behaving badly near the public which means using the loo you know behind a tree where other people are <laughs> having a picnic um so <laughs> Do but you even the fine for that, just while I, uh, let yeah, yeah. Right <laughs> even so. and make sure which which way the wind's blowing. Even even if the even the fines for that are kind of more lenient than than this. So it all feels like it's not quite right, and they need to rethink it and introduce it in a more proportionate way. True. I mean, maybe you should just do all your business straight into your bib shorts. There you go. And <laughs> on that note. Um, uh, let's talk about the fact. The other interesting point is the fact that uh, both the men's and the women's races uh, were run on the same day. So let's talk about the impact that had on the prestige and coverage of both the men's and women's Tour of Flanders. In general, Jeremy, is this a good thing, running both races on the same day? Well, I'm not, in fa- I'm not in favour of it because I think uh, one or the other loses out in terms of, you know, if the, if the men's race is more exciting than, than the women's race, not, not, not that I'm taking any uh, sides here, um, but uh, if the men's race, race is more exciting than the women's race, it will get more media coverage than the women's race, whether that's a deserved thing or not. That's just the, the way it will work. Also, you will find that the media have limited budgets, so and limited timescales and deadlines, etc. And, so and so on, and resources on site. So they will go with whatever is the biggest story, which may not always be the women's race. So I don't, I don't know... But if, if you're it works, about, it? but if you're talking about limited 
budgets and limited deadlines than doing something across the whole weekend and running, running the women's on the Saturday and the men's on the Sunday. Well, Does that if, also then people go, well, we'll just cover the men's then? Or... No, because I think, I, think, I think having what they're going to do with the Paris-Roubaix inaugural women's race is they're going to have it on the Saturday and the men's race on the Sunday. I would argue that's better because the media will arrive anyway on the Saturday for the men's Paris-Roubaix, so they will already be in situ. So they will, whether, whether they give the race as much space as it maybe deserves, as much space as the men's race, they will already be there. So they will give it coverage, definitely give it coverage. Um, and it will be, you know, the race of the day, rather than there being two races of the day. And you're expecting editors, whether they're production editors on TV or radio or whatever, or newspapers or online, they're going to make a choice about which is it. And, and there'll be a hierarchy. If you have them on separate days, and I think you... You disperse that more. I think for I mean, a one day race that works, but not for a not for a stage race. Um, but this has been a talking point in cycling for for, for ages. <laughs> no one seems to have, have quite nailed it yet. But I agree for a one day race having it on the same weekend perhaps works because it almost becomes like a stadium sport, doesn't it? Everyone's in the same area. So how do you make a stage race work with the men's and the women's? If say the Tour de France, you know, whenever they finally pull the finger out and have the women's Tour de France, how do you do it? Run it the week before? Run it two weeks before? Run it at the same no, time see, on the same day? Then I think you'd have it at, uh, on the same day. Maybe I'm not at the same time, but I think then it makes sense on, on, the same, on the same day. I think different times. It's like, you know, with the Giro Rosso, it's the biggest event in the women's calendar. I've interviewed Marianne Voss about this before, and she's quite happy with where it is because she's like, in terms of the women's cal- calendar, it works for them. But as Jez was saying, like, the media, especially these days, have limited resources. And if the Tour de France is on at the same time in a different country, none of my editors can afford or will send me to cover to cover both. Like the Tour de France, well, is the Tour de France, I hate saying that. That's where I'm going to be sent, for example, whether I whether I like it or, or not. But so that, but that, that, stage that, races. That doesn't really come down to women's races, though, does it? The Tour de France eclipses everything in cycling. It is, you know, it's the one thing that transcends yeah, that's, it. That's my point. So t- for me, I've always just not seen the sense in having those two races on at the same time in different places. <laughs> I think so, if it was run before, like run before or, you know, slightly concurrently, then then that, in my opinion, would be My better. point about this would be, would be, so say you've got stage seven of the Women's Tour de France starting at 10 o'clock in Bordeaux and you've got stage seven of the men's Tour de France starting at midday in Bordeaux. But you want to be at the finish line for the women's stage. But you also want to cover the start of the men's stage. How do you do that? I mean, if you're te- you, you, have to, you have to double up your people because there's no way that you can do that, that people can move around that fast. Anyone who's worked on the tour for as many years as we all have can realise the logistics are extremely difficult. Then how do you do... How do you give the stories justice? It means you have to double up with your crew. You know, you have to have more journalists, mm. more yeah. photographers, more 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 sound recorders, etc. Uh-huh. More drivers, etc., etc. On site and editors, uh, you know, they just aren't the budgets anymore for that. Absolutely kind of thing. true. Absolutely true, Jeremy. I guess the point is when the whole world goes back to normal and we aren't in COVID lockdowns and protocols and trying to stay away from people. Do you think the same amount of journalists will be back on the Tour de France as has been historically up to this point? No, no. So does that change it already? Yes, it probably does, yeah. I mean, I, I personally, because I think that women's racing racing should have its own pro- profile, its own status, and should be standalone and should stand on, its, stand on its own two feet. And I mean, what I mean when I say that is I mean that it should be recognised as fully as men's racing is. And I know we've got to support women's racing to get to that point. But I think <clears throat> by having it as a bolt-on to the men's race, which is what running on the same day effectively is, which was my problem with the Tour of Flanders because it was a bolt on after, after the men's race. I just think it really demeans it and undermines it. I, th- I think there's an issue there for, I mean, if you just look at Flanders as an example, I mean, I watched uh, probably from one o'clock on, on Saturday afternoon, the, the men's race, so the last three hours of the race, I guess. And then the women's race followed on, Pretty much. Well, I mean, I think I caught the last fifty-five k or something. So I probably watched five hours of racing. Now I'm not. I'm not going to do that for. Um, I, I mean, I don't know how long the women's Tour de France is is going to be. Nobody knows that yet. But I mean, if it's if it's a week, which most people think it's going to be, I'm not going to do that for one week when the when the men's race is on as well. I'm not. I'm not going to devote five hours to as a fan 
to, to watching the race. I might I might want to, but it's not going to fit in with all the other things I've got to do in my life. It's just it's just impractical. I mean, as as I understand it, the women's race, the women's tour is going to start on the same day that the men's finishes in 2022. That'll be the plan, and it'll run for a week, and so it'll kind of it'll get sort of triggered by the men's race but then it'll it'll go off on it on its own and just kind of uh, for journalists I, I guess it'll mean staying at the race for a month so or yeah go, but that in itself home. is difficult again isn't it yeah because it's the same problem really you either have and this is the case already you have journalists who who really specialize in women's cycling and others that specialize in men's cycling and they generally already I think go to one or the other I don't know about you guys, though, but at the end of the Tour de France, I'm dead. I'm so dead. I'm in the men's Tour de France. I come home and sleep for a week. That's, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> so same, to do same. another a month on top of that, I, it's not I, I physically couldn't do that, I don't think. Yeah, and I, th I think also, again, that you see, that's my argument, that it's slightly insulting to women's racing to just think, oh, we'll just get this bunch of, you know, knackered journos <laughs> and, media, and media who've been traipsing around off the men. We'll just push them out for another, for another week. Obviously, that's not ideal, and it, it means then they're not going to get the best kind of coverage that they should get. So, you know, if there's clear daylight between the two races, they also, what about spectators? I look forward to watching great stage races. You know, I get excited about knowing that the Giro's coming or the Tour's coming or the Vuelta. I don't want the Women's Tour de France, after all this time waiting for it to make a return, to be this kind of afterthought. Or bolt on. It no. shouldn't be. It deserves more, much more prestige and status than that. Hey, Jeremy, when you're gallivanting around the world, appearing like a yogic guru in places such as Australia, or mm. maybe America, or even Canada, how do you keep up with the spring classics? I watch them at flowbikes.com forward slash aerogram. No, say it in a more yogic voice for me. <laughs> <laughs> What's yogic? I didn't even know what that means. Like Yogi Bear. <laughs> Go on. OJ, I watch them at flowbikes.com forward slash aerogram. Wow, I'm so aroused. Okay, we'll keep all that in. Let's end on Nasser Buhani. Now, we mentioned him last week and how he ended up shoulder to shoulder with Jake Stewart in a sprint at Chalopé de la Loire. Uh, ended with Jake Stewart breaking his hand on the barriers. Amid a USA investigation, the quotes from Nasser Buhani have been wild. Um, he said he didn't mean to do it and sort of apologised. He then rode that back and I'm, you know, this is... This is me loosely quoting him here. He quoted the fact that he's a father, so he definitely wouldn't do it, that sprinting isn't care bears, as William mentioned earlier on, that if Stuart saw his life flash before his eyes, he possibly should give up sprinting. Let's deal with this part of what's going on first, because it does get a lot more sinister after this. We all have seen the move. It looked bad. The UCI are right to investigate this, aren't they, Jeremy? Uh, I think the thing is there's a precedent set now with Dylan Grunewagen and what happened in the Tour of Poland last year um, with the the crash with Fabio Jakobsen so understandably there was a very strong reaction to him indubitably pushing Jake Stewart into the barriers fortunately the barriers held up and Jake Stewart didn't crash because it could have been a lot lot worse the problem is that I think there's been a pile on on social media against Buhani who's always been a bit of a he's, he's a bad boy he's the bad boy of sprinting you know and he's been kind of a uh, so he's been, you know, uh, yelled at and shouted at by almost every other rival sprinter for his behaviour in the past mm -hmm. eight or ten years, and there's lots of incidents where he's been involved in crashes. Some, some um, because of his erratic sprinting sprinting style, and some because of the chaos that he leaves in his wake. Having said all that, he's a highly talented sprinter, but this was beyond the pale in the current climate, definitely. What the the quotes, the things that have been said to him, or the actual move that he put. Jake. The move that the move that he pulled was was outrageous, and I think he's absolutely right that he should be sanctioned for it. Because if Grunewigen suffered such a lengthy ban, I mean, you wonder what would have happened if if Jake Stewart had gone down and been more injured. Then you know, it's a really really serious business. In a way, Buhan is lucky that he didn't, because I think whilst it, it, it the intent was pretty much the same, um, he was elbowing him out of the way. The the kind of outcome was was much, much lesser. Yeah, but it's, it's worth pointing out that he pushed him into the barriers. This is the point he pushed yeah, him yeah, into yeah. the barriers. 
No, so, I don't think anyone's disputing that. So I don't think he's disputing that either. I mean, he's apologised. He said whatever comes from, as I as I say, I'm loosely quoting this. He said whatever comes from the UCI, he's fair with. Now the undertow to all this is the racial undertow, because Jeremy, a lot has been written to him. And he put it in a in a, an Instagram post that went onto his Instagram over this week. He has been subject to some pretty horrific racial abuse over this. Well, the problem is, is that racism is such a big issue for this sport. Um, and it's a it's an issue that the sport will not confront, and I find it <clears throat> appalling that it won't confront it, uh, specifically at a time in the history of the world when racism is becoming such such an important issue. Um, and Buhani, I think, has been subject to racist abuse in the past, um, but he's kind of cracked, and he posted on Instagram earlier that. Um, he said that people had been saying he should go back to Africa, that he was a criminal, that he was a North African who needs to be interned and that they were constantly sending him pig emojis. Um, and he goes on to say that he was born in France and that he's going to file a, com a police complaint. Um, I've been putting up with this for a long time already and I've kept quiet, but this time I won't. So where's the UCI in all this? Where's the CPA, the Riders Association? Where are the teams? Where are the sponsors? Where even are the media? Because we need to condemn this. This, that, that it's fine to criticise him for his erratic sprinting, for his dangerous sprinting. I'm fine with that. I think it was dangerous and erratic as well, and it's not the first time. But to abuse him or to pursue him because of the colour of his skin is just so... It's so outrageous that this sport does so little to act on this. And even this evening, you know, silence, tumbleweed about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with Jeremy on this, so I'm kind of... Uh... I probably describe my mood as incandescent at the moment. I'm just so furious. I've seen rider after rider and, and fans and all, all kinds of people complaining about bottles being handed to kids and what an injustice it is. And Buani's been racially abused on social media. And so far I've seen maybe four or five of his teammates come out in support of him, which is great. The only other two riders I've seen from outside his team, I've seen three riders actually, is uh, Kevin Reza and Gregory Bourget, who's a track sprinter, both of them both of them black riders, and Charles Planet, who rides for the uh, uh, Novo Nordisk team. And, I mean, like Jeremy says, other, apart from that, it's tumbleweed. And it, forget bottles. This, this, is, this yes, is a big issue. Yeah. This is what we need to... This is what we need to be talking about we need to get rid of i mean we need to get rid of this in every sport it's not just cycling but we've got this moment in cycling where buani for whatever you think about him should not be receiving this kind of abuse i oh. i agree and it seems to be in the past that something that cycling's just sort of tried to sweep under a rug and we've seen that with gianni moscon before who's not been a victim in this but i'd go so far as to say an offender and at least Buhani's come out in the first place with his, with his apology. And he's written that, hasn't he? It's not like someone from the team, like with Moscon previously, it's just, you know, he's been, he's done a, an apology to camera that his team has clearly told him to do and that I would doubt is even in his own words. You know, Buhani with this is, I think, in his own words, apologised for the incident in the start. And then I think people of public prominence are told, you know, trolls are, are weak people in general. I've got no time for them. And they're told to rise above it, I think. And he would know that, and he probably has in the past. So the fact that he's actually, it's got so bad that he's come out and said something. And this has been, like Pete said, the, the case across a lot of sports. It's it's starting to be recognised and, and more reported. But cycling seems to, if it's, you know, in the spotlight, be like, oh, quickly, like, issue a, issue a sh short statement. But if it's not a key rider or it's not caught on camera, like in this instance, it's it's just sort of, it's not even really been recognised. And I agree, if we're going to bring in fines for you know, throwing a bin, then this should be, particularly when we have two rider unions now, one official, one unofficial, it is disappointing that no one stepped up or this hasn't been made a bigger but, issue of. But we've had a lot of fine words, haven't we, in the last... I mean, I've written some fine, you know, fine words in inverted commas about how terrible it all is. In, in, in the last year or so because of BLM, because of everything that happened with George Floyd, you know, because of all the stuff that's happened that we all know about in the last year. This is the UCI's moment, you know. This is the moment for the teams, for the riders who, like Theo Gegen Hart, who's spoken out, for the other riders as well who, who, who've, who've said sympathetic things towards uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. This is the time. This is their moment now. And they're all silent. 
and it makes my blood boil it really does because they're not going to change things and they have to change things because he cannot be abused because of the color of his skin full stop he can be criticized for sprinting but not for the color of his skin well, I think, I think what we should do is, because when we're recording this, as we say, there's been no statement from the UCI, and as far as we've seen, we've not seen any support other than a few teammates come out for Nasser Buhani. So I think let's pick this up in the next episode and see what happens over the next seven days, because I, I think it will be fascinating to the wrong word. I think it'll be interesting to see which path cycling is taking and what is a super serious issue. Thank you very much for joining us. As always, we are done. Remember to subscribe to this podcast, please. It'd be lovely if you do so. Ratings are always nice. You can check out all the writings over on lacourseontet.com. And in the absence of Paris Roubaix, I want to leave you with a clip from the excellent film called A Sunday in Hell, which you can find on YouTube to watch uh, whenever you want. To whet your appetite, I asked the FOD for a clip that sums up not just the film, but the entire race. He chose this. What gives Paris Roubaix its reputation as the hardest and most fascinating of all classic one day races is the drama which always accompanies the last part of the course over the infamous L'Enfer du Nord, the Hell of the North. This hell consists of some primitive, narrow country roads with centuries old cobblestones, Les Pave du Nord, roads no longer used for ordinary civilized traffic, but only for the driving of cattle and for a bicycle race. A truly legendary course. Year after year, this hell is the setting for a veritable Dante's Inferno with incredible tortures and even martyrdom. Sometimes the roadside is transformed into a quagmire and the cobblestones into a skating rink. And this hell has become the home ground of the Flemish supermen. An exclusive affair reserved only for the strongest. <laughs>